Good morning, folks. So good to see each of you here on a beautiful first Sunday morning of September. Can you believe it? And I'm so glad you're here, and I appreciate you being in the Lord's house. Take your Bibles and turn to Psalm 72. Psalm 72. And we'll start reading down verse number 17. Psalm 72 and verse number 17. His name shall endure forever. His name shall be continued as long as the sun, and men shall be blessed in him, and all nations shall call him blessed. Blessed be the Lord God, the God of Israel, who only doth wondrous things, and blessed be his glorious name forever, and let the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Dear Jesus, Thank you for your goodness. Indeed, your name needs to be lifted high. You have blessed us with multiple blessings. Your mercies are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. And Lord, as we come this morning, I pray, Lord, that our hearts would be in tune with you. I know there's many things in our lives that can grab our attention, our focus. And Lord, I pray during this hour that we would put those things aside and we would focused on worshiping you, lifting your name in praise. As we look in your word, Lord, to be edified by it, to be changed for you. And Lord, I pray that you would bless this service and all parts of it. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Good morning, church. Let's all stand up as as we sing Springs of Living Water this morning. All right, on the first verse. I thirsted in the barren land of sin and shame, and nothing satisfying there I found. But to the blessed cross of Christ one day I came, where springs of living water did abound. Drinking at the springs of living water, happy now am I, my soul they satisfy. Drinking at the springs of living water, oh, wonderful and bountiful supply. How sweet the living water from the hills of God, it makes me glad and happy all the way. Now glory, grace, and missing mark the path I've trod, I'm shouting hallelujah every day. Drinking at the springs of living water, happy now am I, my 
so they satisfy drinking at the springs of living water oh wonderful and bountiful supply on the last oh sinner won't you come today to calvary a fountain there is flowing deep and wide the savior now invites you to the water free where thirsting spirits can be satisfied drinking at the springs of living water happy now am i my soul they satisfy drinking at the springs of living water oh wonderful and bountiful supply amen remain standing as we sing in my heart the rings a melody Sorry, I'm on there now. Okay, let's begin. I have a song that Jesus gave me. It was sent from heaven above. There never was a sweeter melody. Tis a melody of love. In my heart there rings a melody. There rings a melody with heaven's harmony. In my heart there rings a melody, there rings a melody of love. I love the Christ who died on Calvary, for he washed my sins away. He put within my heart a melody, and I know it's there to stay. In my heart there rings a melody, there a melody with heaven's harmony in my heart there rings a melody there rings a melody of love to be my endless theme in glory with the angels i will sing to be a song with glorious harmony when the courts of heaven ring harmony in my heart there rings a melody there rings a melody of love amen you may be seated all right some announcements for us upcoming uh, there uh, will be no uh, 11 o'clock service uh, today uh, there's a big parade going on and things and you probably saw some tents and things cooking happening and Soon there'll be all kinds of people in traffic around, so we're just going to do the 9 o'clock service today. And uh, we'll, we won't have a cafe either. We don't want you to get trapped in here. We, I, I have counseled some people. They have PTSD after getting caught in here last time. They couldn't get out and things, so we won't have any cafe. You're welcome to stick around and chat and things, but we just won't have that today. We'll be back to normal next week, uh, Lord willing, so we look forward to that. I do want to say thank you again to Church Family for all lovely texts, messages, and uh, birthday cards and gifts and things uh, to myself and my wife. Uh, very much blessed. We thank you for that. We appreciate it so, so much. All right, so September is here, and so there's lots of things on the calendar. Uh, next uh, Saturday is Outreach, and that's at 10.30 a.m. That's obviously weather permitting, uh, so love to have you come out uh, for that next Saturday. And then we have what's called Church Open House and this is going to be on Friday, September 13th. That's going to be at 6 uh, p.m. And Pastor Matt's really organizing all this. Uh, it's it's a, a definitely part of his vision in our outreach. I've never been involved with anything like this. Just the idea that we have people around the church as people walk by, and there's lots of people walking by our church all the time. And we want to invite them in, look at the church, and uh, interact with them. So we, we need some volunteers to help to be in the church and and greet them, witness the folks as well. So if that's something you're interested in, that's on Friday, September 13th. Uh, you talk to him. Now, he's not here. Him and his dear wife are away for their anniversary, all right? So he, I won't tell you what's going to happen because he's probably watching. So at any rate, we'll, we'll get him. We'll, we'll, we'll encourage both of them, all right? Uh, so uh, we, there, he'll be back next week, so if you want to talk to him, or you can reach out to him during this week uh, if you have his contact information. I know he'd love to hear from you. Uh, so I uh, hope you can be involved with that. 
And it's September the 15th is back to school Sunday. And that week after that Sunday, we'll be getting back to our WBF, resuming the, the weekly schedule. And uh, next week, we'll give you some more information. We, we're looking to add another Bible study uh, location and as well as just a different, a little bit of a different schedule that we do uh, or will be doing this fall. So we look forward to that. And in Fall Fair, September 29th, the last uh, Sunday of this month, if you are interested in being involved with the Fall Fair, please see my wife, Michelle, after the service. She'll be in the foyer. Please uh, ask or let her know if you're interested or not to be involved. There's lots of work to be done uh, to put everything together. Always a great time. We look forward to it. Uh, so again, if you're involved, interested in being involved, even in a little way, see my wife after the service in the foyer. And then uh, we had a great weekend of activities at our church. The ladies seemed to like the paint. No, they loved the painting, all right? Had a great time. The uh, East Wing was packed over there. I think we had close to 40 ladies involved with the painting and things and had a great time of fellowship. And it was a great time, great Friday evening. And then yesterday, golfing. Uh, we had about 22, 21 folks out. We had a great time and a great time of fellowship and encouragement and being encouraging by God's creation. Uh, so I'm glad that uh, those who were involved with that, I'm glad that you're here. Most importantly, that you're here today at church Sunday morning. We're glad that you're here. So I'm going to ask the ushers to come forward this time to take the offering. And as they come, let's look to the Lord in prayer. Dear Jesus, thank you for this time. Thank you for the opportunity to give back to you. Lord, I pray you help us to use these funds in great ways to reach the lost, to encourage the saints. Lord, to see missionaries go forth. Lord, there's so many things that we can do with the finances. And Lord, help us to be wise stewards, Lord, and pray you would bless this offering in a great, great way. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> JC, and let's all stand up as we sing Jesus is all the world to me, and kids at this time 12 and under are dismissed for their kids' church. <clears throat> all right, on the first verse. Jesus is all the world to me, my life, my joy, my own. strength from day to day without him I would fall when I am sad to him I go no other one can cheer me so when I am sad 
sad. He makes me glad. He's my friend. Jesus is all the world to me. My friend in trial so the sunshine and the rain. He sends the harvest golden grain. Sunshine and rain, harvest of grain. He's my friend. Jesus is all Appreciate song leading this morning. Appreciate those all involved with the worship of our, at our church each and every week. Take your Bibles, Acts chapter number 12. Acts chapter number 12. It's good to see you at church. I understand that your attendance at church is a blessing to me. It's a blessing to others that attend our church and to visitors as well. But, you know, most importantly, the Lord is pleased when you're at church. He tells us not to forsake the assembling of ourselves. He's pleased when we're at church. And I'm, again, never discount the importance of being at church. Uh, the world, unfortunately, would like us to think it's not that important, uh, but it's very important. It's very encouraging to see you. Uh, so it's a few things to pray about. Kids are back to school this week. Some kids are excited. Some kids are sad, but all the parents are happy, right? Summer, we talk about how quickly summer is. You're like... Some weeks felt like years with all the kids running around. But at any rate, let's be in prayer for our kids as they go back to school this week. And let's be in prayer for our church family. Uh, we, as I mentioned already, announcements. We have a, a busy month of ministry in September. Uh, and we want to be reaching folks for Christ and, and impacting them and uh, get, having Christians have a greater relationship, walk with the Lord. So pray for our outreach, or our open house, back to school, and the fall fair at the end of the month. We certainly want to be using those opportunities to impact those around us for Christ. So let's look to the Lord in prayer. Dear Jesus, thank you for this opportunity. And Lord, we thank you for your many blessings. And we thank you for the children of our church, the families that are represented in our church. And Lord, I pray you'd help them, moms and dads, as they get their little ones back to school. And Lord, I pray you encourage them, give them the patience they need. And the little ones, as they learn, Lord, give them the abilities to comprehend that what's being taught, and Lord, that uh, Lord, they would uh, grow to be young men and women who want to serve you and do what is right. 
That is our desire, and that's what we try to do here, encourage those little people to serve you, to know you as their personal Lord and Savior. Lord, I pray you be with our church in September and lots of different ministry opportunities and outreaches occurring. Lord, I pray you give us good weather in these events. And Lord, I pray you give us great opportunities to encourage folks to come to church and invite and witness. And Lord, that uh, souls would be impacted by the gospel. And Lord, that Christians would draw closer to you. Lord, we look to you. It's by your hands. Uh, Lord, uh, we look to you to provide. Lord, I pray you watch over us. And Lord, give us a, a time now in the Word that will be encouraging, edifying to all that are here and those who are watching online. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So Acts chapter number 12 and verse uh, number 1. Now about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. And he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because it, he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of the unleavened bread. And when he apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. The title of my message is Prayer Changes Everything. Prayer Changes Everything. And prayer is a wonderful privilege that we have as believers. God has opened the door to the throne room and He invites us to come, bring our petitions, uh, bring those needs in our hearts and lives into His presence and give them to Him. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16 says... Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace in help and to help in time of need. I think all of us have times of need, don't we? We all do, no matter our station in life, no matter our age, we have those times and He's promised to hear us when we call. The Lord is available all the time. He listens. He's promised to answer our prayers when we pray according to His will. And we'll read that verse in 1 John chapter 5 in just a few minutes. I certainly hope you've experienced the power of private prayer. You praying yourself and experience the Lord answering those prayers in great ways above even what you thought in your own secret time of communication with the Lord. And, and you give Him the honor and glory for it. I was thinking about this week about... Uh, like answer prayer in my own life, and one kind of popped in my head. And that was, we moved here 14 years ago, and I remember when we first moved, we didn't have a house here, and we prayed earnestly for a house. I'm happy to tell you I have not been homeless for 14 years. The Lord answered the prayer quickly after we got here. And, and it's a wonderful house. It's a home that works well for us. Uh, yes, we... We wish we had a view of the ocean. That is not possible, Ontario. I understand that. I guess up in Hudson Bay you could. But at any rate, you know, there's all kinds of things you would like, but the Lord provided exactly what we needed. Isn't that our God? He provides what we need. And that's an answer prayer, a personal. And, and something that we should do uh, daily is to pray and, and bring those petitions and ask for strength and ask for wisdom and worship the Lord and give Him thanks for what He's done. But this passage we're going to look at, it, it's, there's power in corporate prayer as well. We need to have that personal secret time of prayer with the Lord, no doubt. But there's a special dynamic that comes into play when God's children come together in united faith and they pray for something or for someone and seek the Lord's wisdom, His answered prayer to that situation. We see, first of all, a season of trouble, a season of troubles here. Uh, the events in this chapter occur in 44 A.D. There's individuals who are mentioned here who are historical figures. In a sense, you will find them in secular history. And about one is being Herod. Herod uh, dies at the end of this chapter. We will read that in a little bit. And when he dies, Judah becomes a Roman province, which really increases the tension between the Jewish people, the nation of Israel, and imperial Rome which will eventually lead to A.D. 70 when Jerusalem is destroyed, sacked by Rome. The Herod mentioned here is Herod Agrippa I. He was the grandson of Herod the Great. He was really a puppet king installed by the Roman emperor uh, many years before, uh, Galio, I think is how you say his name. And he was a king from 42 
to 44 AD. So he wasn't a king very long, a couple years. Herod was a nominal Jew who wanted nothing more. He, he wasn't looking for uh, re religion to help him. He wasn't cared about Judaism. He wasn't cared about any of that. All he wanted, all Herod wanted was favor of Rome. That's all he wanted. He's in his mind, that's what he could get. And he wanted to grow and influence and power and things. So we see attacks, the attacks. James, the brother of John, one of the Lord's inner circle, is put to death by Herod. We see that. We read that already in verse number one. And then we see Peter has also been in prison. And he's sitting in there on death row awaiting his own ex execution. And the, the Jews uh, pressed their attacks against the early church because they hated the message of the gospel. And they saw that a lot of the leaders in Jerusalem obviously would be Jewish, formerly Jewish people who believe in Judaism, and now they're no longer believing that, and now they're preaching this gospel, and they're like, we want them gone. We, won't, we don't want them around. And Herod quickly discovered persecuting Christians gave him some political clout. It gave him an advantage. He won some points, and he was a very shrewd individual. He could care less about religion, but if people were happy with him, that means he could do more of his own things, and he was good with that. You know, just think for a moment, the local church here, verses uh, 1 to 4, you know, there's got to be some degree of anxious moments. Your leaders, so we see that, again, that uh, Herod had uh, killed John, uh, James, and, and now Peter was in prison. These, these men were leaders in the church. These were the pastors of the church, and now they're being removed. I'm, I'm sure there would have been some fear. There would have been uncertainty amongst the congregations, like, okay, so when they're done with the leaders, are they coming after us? I mean, that's not hard to connect the dots, right? That's not a stretch. They're taking out the leadership, and then they'll come for us. I mean, that, that makes sense. And I'm sure they were afraid what would eventually take place. We see the enemies. We're told that Herod is the one who killed James. That was, again, brother of John. And Herod saw this helped him politically, so he arrested Peter. It was the spring of the year, the days of unleaded bread. It was uh, the eighth day after the Passover, so it, it, was, it was the preference. Again, this, we see the connection with the Jewish leadership in the city of Jerusalem. It was the pious Jews who didn't want to see anyone executed during these high days after the Passover. Quadrillions of soldiers, that's four. So there was four of those. So that was 16 in total. 16 total soldiers guarding, watching out for one prisoner. They were watching him. All right, so let's look at verse number five. Peter, therefore, was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the, uh, of the church unto God for him. And when Herod would have brought him forth the same night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains, and the keepers before the door kept the prison. Sounds like he's pretty solid, right? This guy's not going anywhere. The enemy has him surrounded. So Herod and the Jews were responsible for the persecution. But that was merely the human instrument of that persecution. The enemy, the organization, the empowerment of it is from the enemy of Satan. Satan is opposed to the church. He's opposed to the gospel. He's opposed to worshiping the Lord. He was out to destroy the church and destroy it while it was still in its early days. The church still finds itself under attack today. We still have enemies. Satan hasn't gone anywhere. There's still wicked men in the world. There's men like Herod around. There are many places in the world today that being part of a, a local assembly like this this morning would be very dangerous. Very dangerous. Highly probable that you would die because you call yourself a Christian. Highly probable. I, I've, I've read some articles recently about uh, areas that churches are attacked frequently and uh, as Libya comes there, North Korea, Nigeria, Pakistan, just to name a few. And sometimes we see those attacks on the TV and news reported, but lots of times it's not reported. We must never think that we're immune because we live in North America, uh, because we live in Canada. We're immune from the assaults 
from without. Sometimes the assaults come from within. As long as Satan is at work and he's at work, we know his, we know his end and he has lots of work to do and he's going to be at until the very end. He'll do whatever he can to disrupt the church. He hates the message of gospel as much as back in Acts as he does now. He, he doesn't love it. He hates it. He hates Jesus Christ. He hates our master, our savior. He knows that if he can turn Christians against one another, he can reduce effectiveness in the ministry. And even better, and he's been successful many times, he's even seen churches close their doors because of infighting or whatever the case. We live in a world and minister in a world that is largely apathetic towards anything religious, particularly in Canada. You know, there's the, grow, the most growing percentage of Canadians religiously is non-religious. I don't want any religion. And it's not like that they're against, they come against you with uh, sticks and stones or anything against Christians. They're like, oh, that's great for you. I don't need it. Why do I need that? I have all this. So it's apathy. Whatever. If that's good for you. Oh, and then there's definitely those who are in the column of opposed or hostile towards the church and the message that we preach. We're not immune from troubles. There are attacks and problems, and when they happen, we need God's help as much as the church in this time in Acts chapter 12 needed him. We need the Lord all the time, amen? We can't build a church on our own. We need to be faithful, and we'll look at that in a few moments, but we need the Lord all the time. If we're trying to do this in our own strength, it is a waste of time. It won't matter for eternity if we try to do it on our own. We need to do it for the Lord. We see verse number five, uh, uh, a, a time of prayer. He was put in the prison and then where prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. This situation looks bleak. James is dead. I mean, James was a great man. He, he served the church. He loved the church. You know, when, when a pastor who just taken away from us in a sense of before the, you know, we would think his prime or in his prime or suddenly, you know, passes away. That's painful. This is, he's taken and killed because he's preaching the gospel and now Peter is in prison. This is a horrible situation. It looks like Peter's going to die, but in the face of overwhelming problems, the church bows its head as such as, a, as one and calls unto God. It lifted, lifted its voice collectively. Did that mean that everybody that was in the part of the church in Jerusalem got together in the Jerusalem church? No, because they didn't have a church like we think today. But they got together in smaller groups, no doubt. And if they weren't together in groups, they, were, they had one prayer request. Lord, save Peter. That's what they were praying. And they, they, and they moved in power to bring this answer to prayer. It was fervent. Prayer was made, it was a fervent prayer, was made without ceasing. The word without ceasing conveys only the idea of ongoing prayer, but it was fervent. This was something that was meant something to these people. The, these people were pouring out their hearts to the Lord. Lord, we need you to answer this prayer. We love Peter. There's so much to do. Lord, save Peter. Remove him from jail. Save Peter. I don't know exactly what they said, but that's the general gist of it. Save him. Save him. They're seeking the Lord. That's the kind of prayer, praying we need to undertake. We don't have anyone in our church named Peter that I'm aware of. And it, so it, there's no one in, in our church, Peter, in jail. But the idea that fervency should be part of our prayer life. We need to have that same kind of prayer, prayer life. The promise of God is that the effectual fervent prayer of the righteous man availeth much. The words effectual, fervent, refer to energetic, passionate prayer. Now, I, we, don't, we don't pray to get rated of, oh, he's got a better, he's more passionate prayer, praying individual. No, we don't do it that way. But the idea is that when we come to the Lord, it's not like, Lord, it's a nice day. Can you, can you help me with that? No, that's really blasé, isn't it? You know, that, if, if one of my kids came to me, Matthew likes to play uh, street hockey, if Matthew came to me and said, hey, Dad, you want to play hockey? I'd be like, you really don't want to play hockey. 
You're so blasé about it. I'd be like, no, let's go eat. <laughs> you know, he's not interested that really that much. But Matthew came in the room and was like, Dad, do you want to play hockey with me? I saw this awesome shot. I want to try it. No, he wants to play hockey, right? He's passionate about it. When we come to the Lord, let's not be like, oh, no, Lord, help me. Give me wisdom or whatever the case is. Come with a heart that's, Lord, help. It's not casual. It's not, ca it's not half hearted. You pour out your burdens. You pour out, Lord, help, or give me the, the wisdom. Give me the strength. Uh, give me the understanding. Lord, help this person, whatever the case. Their prayers were made to God. Now, this seems obvious, but there's times when it seems like the prayers are designed just to be heard, if you know what I'm saying. We're talking about in a corporate, in a church body. I've been in some churches, and I think the guy read a thesaurus before he started praying. You know, all these different words that I would never use, and, uh, you know, and it uh, seems like it's a bit, I'm not saying the person was, but it seems like a bit of a show in my mind. Like, but I've not been with people when they pray. I think one guy in particular, his name is Earl Jerry. And whenever Earl Jerry would pray, I felt like the Lord was there. He had a powerful prayer life. And that's what we need to have. It's not about who can hear my voice. Who cares about hearing my voice? I want to talk to the Lord. I need to talk to him. I need to bring these things to him. The congregation uh, joined their voices and they reached up and they prayed in faith. They were praying in faith. Lord, because they couldn't go uh, bust Peter out of jail. I mean, they, they weren't looking to uh, physical action to remove him and start a rebellion. No, no, none of that. They were praying in faith. Lord, you need to do it. Faith is an essential ingredient in our prayers. Can you imagine praying to the Lord and never believing he can do what you're asking him to do? What a waste of time. Hey, I hope when you come to the Lord in prayer, you, ex you know that he can answer. It. it depends if his will, if he will answer yes or no, or maybe later. My God is the God who created this universe. I can trust him. I can have faith in him that he cares about me and he will answer. Hebrews 11, verse 6. But without God is impossible to please him. For he that comes to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Matthew 21, 22. And all things whatsoever ye ask in prayer, believing ye shall receive. 1 John 5, 14. And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hear us whatsoever we ask, we know that we have petitions that we desire of him. You know, I never question, I never stop and ask the Lord, is it your will, Lord, if I pray for this person who's lost? No, because the Lord desires all men come to him. And Lord, is it, is it your will for me to pray for believers who are going through hard times? No, because I need to encourage the brethren. That's a good thing to pray about. I don't have to worry about those. That's not outside of God's will. We're, we're talking to the Father. He's our Father. You can bring those things to Him. Hey, my dad and my mom, I, I speak to them often. My dad's 70 now. He turned 70 last December. I still phone him from time to time and tell him, hey, Dad, this is going on. Or, Dad, what do you think about this? Or, Dad, I need a hand with this. What? I'm, I'm not afraid to talk to my dad. He's my dad. He's my father. And you know what, what I find is, it's always, <coughs> excuse me, it's always encouraging, is that when I phone, he goes, ah, oh, it's good to hear from you. Don't you think our Heavenly Father wants to hear from us? Absolutely. We need to bring those requests to Him. It was a focused prayer. Prayer was made for Him. That's for Peter. Peter was the focus of this prayer meeting. Uh, where did I? Okay, down verse number seven. And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and the light shined in the prison, and he smote Peter on the side, raised him up, saying, Arise, up quickly. And his chains fell off from his hands. And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself, and bind up thy sandals. So he did. And he says unto him, Cast thy garment about thee, and follow me. And he went out and followed him. 
and wist not that this was, a, it was true, which was done by the angel, but thought he was a vision. And when they were past the first and second ward, they came into the iron gate that leadeth unto the city, which opened to them of his own accord. And they went out and passed on through one street, and forthwith the angel departed from him. And when Peter was come to himself, he said, I know, Now I know of a surety that the Lord hath sent this angel, and it delivered me out of the hand of Herod, and from the, all the expectation of the people of the Jews. This is what the people were praying for, that Peter would be set free. This was not a generalization prayer, not a, not a big generalization blanket. Casting a big blanket. You know, when they got together, it's, oh, Lord, give us a wonderful day. Help all the people on the east side of Jerusalem. They need you. And now this was laser focused. Lord, help Peter. Lord, save Peter. Lord, save Peter. This was a very pointed prayer sought you know, seeking God's power for a very, very specific need. You know, if we don't get specific in our prayers, how will we ever know when God answers those prayers? Have you ever thought about that? How, if we're so general in our prayers, how do we know when God answers? When we ask Him specifically, and then we see God specifically answer. Guess what that does? That strengthens your faith. It glorifies Him. It helps us in our relation with Him. It increases our faith. I'm suggesting to you to get very specific in your prayer life. Get very specific. In my own prayer list, I have very specific items that I have. I'm praying for spiritual growth. You're going to say, well, Pastor, that's hard to see because you can't see the heart, that's true. But you know, it doesn't take long to see if someone's heading in the right direction, amen? And then on, you can tell you that if there's spiritual growth going on. If there's spiritual growth, you want to serve the Lord. If there's not spiritual growth, you're getting away from the things of the Lord. It's not that hard to see. I'm praying very specifically that the folks in our church will grow in their faith. I'm praying for more folks to come to our church. Not because Legacy Baptist Church is the greatest church of all time. I love this church. I think it's a great church, but it's not about the people. It's about Jesus Christ. Amen? They need Jesus. And yes, we do have some amazing, well, not some. We're, I love this church. There's lots of great, amazing people here. And we want to witness and encourage each other to go forward with the Lord. But we need to be specific. Lord, here, this is a problem. Here's an issue. Lord, answer this prayer. I'm praying about this. The church gathered together to pray for one of their own. They came together as a family to seek the help of, for a brother in need. Their power, the prayers had the power uh, because they were united in their walk with the Lord and they were of one voice and it was very specific. Lord, hear, hear us, heed us, move in great power. I fear that we fail to pray for one another. We pray for our own needs and we have our own burdens. We have our own issues. Like, I'm not downplaying that for a second. We do. But how much time do you really spend praying for another or for others? You know, right now, there are people in our church that are hurting. I'm not going to get up here and give a big list of Mr. X or Mrs. Y's problems, but we all have different problems. We all have different hurts. There, there's some who are wayward. They're not in church that were once were. There's those who are struggling with grief, others with burdens, maybe physical. There's families having problems raising kids. That's always a joy, right? There's always challenges. Folks whose husband or wife or children are not saved. If you take a minute to think about the church family, it won't take you long to know some people you can pray for. And you can be specific. You know, Lord, help that person who's hurting. And if you know what the hurt is, be specific. Lord, help them with that. Take a minute and, and, and think of the names and the faces of brothers and sisters in Christ. Because the Lord will bring them to mind. I'm going to tell you right now, as you, as you walk with the Lord and you're trying to do what's right, the Lord will bring brothers and sisters to Christ to mind. 
I know he's done it so many times in my own life where he's brought someone to mind in our church or maybe a missionary, maybe another pastor. And then there's times in the church family that you reach out to me and I'm like, oh, I needed that today. Hey, we need people praying for us. We need to be praying for others. Just a little side note here. It's not about prayer. In verse number four, it says, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. The word Easter translated as a common word for the Jewish Passover. In fact, it's translated Passover 28 out of the 29 times it's recorded in Scripture. This is the only place in the Bible it's so translated, and it's accurate. Passover had already passed, and how do I know that? It's because the week of the Feast of the Unleavened Bread was occurring, and that always takes place after the Jewish Passover. The English word Easter is derived from the Roman word estar, which was a pagan spring holiday observed at that, about at the same time. So the King James translators were correct. The Passover was over for the year, and Herod was in a hurry to execute Peter. The Roman holiday of Ashtar was just around the corner. So I've had some people tell me that, that that's wrong. No, this is absolutely correct. It just helps us understand the timing of the situation to what's being referred. Number three, a time of power. A time of power. And I've read verse 11 already. Verse 12, And when he had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. A time of power, a mighty deliverance. When the church prayed, God heard them. He answered their prayers. Paul, uh, Peter was delivered uh, from the prison through miraculous intervention. Like, this is incredible. God saved Peter because the church asked God to save Peter. I mean, they were involved. I wonder what might happen, what God might do if we prayed united. Again, not everybody in the same room, but we have the same mindset and we're praying for the same things. I wonder who might be saved. Didn't God save Peter here? He did physically. I wonder who might be saved if we got a mind behind it, united in there. I wonder what God might do among us if we were united in prayer for certain things, for the right things. I believe that our God is still the God of miracles, amen? His, his power has not changed. God has not seen his power diminished in whatsoever. He is able to do so much more than we've ever seen him do. In fact, the limit of his power have uh, never been witnessed, like in the sense of what he's capable of. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 2. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly, abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. To do exceedingly abundantly above all. Doesn't that give you an idea that God is powerful? Above all. Let's, let's seek him today and ask him, uh, you know, th for things that would bring honor and glory to him. See folks get saved. See our church grow for his honor and glory. A mighty deliverance. Peter is set free. And we see they were astounded. Verse 12. I've read that already. So verse 13. And as Peter knocked at the door or out of the gate, a damsel came to hearken named Rhoda. And when she knew Peter's voice, she opened not the gate for gladness, but ran in and told how Peter stood before the gate, and they said unto her, Thou art mad. But she constantly affirmed that it was even so, and then said they, It is his angel. But Peter continued knocking, and when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. But he, beckoning unto them with the hand to hold their peace, declared unto them how the Lord had brought them out of the prison, and and he said, go show thee the, uh, these things unto James and to the brethren. And he departed and went into another place. He's released, and he went to the house. The church had met to pray in the past, I would think. That's why he went here. He went to the house of Mary, the mother of John Mark. She was a woman of some means, uh, for her house was large enough to have a number of people. Apostles would use her home. He knocked on that gate, and Rhoda came to see who was knocking? Oh, who was knocking on the door? Maybe, maybe somebody else was coming to the prayer meeting, and I don't doubt that they were in a bit of a hiding 
you know, phase that you know, their mindset was protection. We need to protect ourselves and we're not going to leave the gate open. We'll lock it and you come knock and we'll let you in. And she's like, who's there? It's Peter. And she knew his voice, but rather than unlatch it and ah! away she went. She didn't even open the door for Peter. She went back in and told them what was going on. And you're mad, Rhoda. It's not Peter. It's not Peter out there. And then they went on to say, well, it's his angel. Now, <clears throat> the Jewish people believe that when, uh, they assume when someone died, they assume the, the guardian angel, like becoming a, like they assume the body of an angel. Now, that, that's not what's being taught here. This is what they're saying is that he's, he's passed away. He's passed away. And uh, she, and Peter, and then Rhoda never convinced them that it was Peter. It was the continuous knocking by Peter. Maybe, <laughs> maybe he heard them and they're talking about him. It's like, no, I'm alive. It's not my angel. She's not mad. Let me in. One scholar wrote, God could get Peter out of prison, but Peter couldn't get himself into a prayer meeting. <laughs> He got him out, but he couldn't get into that prayer meeting that was all about himself. They were praying for him. And when they investigated, they were astonished. They were amazed. That's what the word means. They were confounded. They were at wonderment. They were, why were they amazed? Weren't they just spending all kinds of time praying for Peter to be released, to be set free, to be saved? Weren't they? They were. They've been praying for this. Why were they so surprised? Well, I think they're just like us because on our best days, we all are marked by a lack of faith. We all have more room to grow in our faith. I, I praise his name that my faith does not have to be perfect. It just needs to be exercised. Amen? My faith doesn't have to be like a gold-plated event. Like I have the, I've reached the gold-plated faith monument or level no i just need to exercise my faith we're a lot like that father who brought his son to jesus who was possessed by demons he believed the lord could do it but he was still filled with doubt and fear still filled that's that that story is found for us in mark chapter 9 and matthew chapter 17 Lord, help my unbelief. I believe, but Lord, help my unbelief. I'm telling you right now, I'm there lots of times. I know the Lord can do it. God created the universe. He can do anything. But I still, Lord, help my unbelief. Help, help me to have greater faith. As long as we live in this world and speak to God in prayer, we'll often be astonished at his answers. You know what? We need to be, we need to be developing a simple childlike faith in our Heavenly Father. You know, our, our kids come to us. If you have kids, if you, 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 the Lord's bless you with children, they come to us, and they just, hey, Dad, can you help me with this? Hey, shouldn't we as Christians come to the Lord and say, Heavenly Father, help us? I, I, I don't know how to take care of this. This is beyond me. I, I need help. And, and let me encourage you, don't, don't wait till there's nothing else you can do Bring it to the Lord right away, okay? A situation comes up, bring it to the Lord right away. Don't wait till you try to figure it all out. No, you make a bigger mess. Bring it to the Lord. Bring it to him right away. In verse 17, Peter rehearses what's taking place. He instructs them to form James. That was a half-brother of Jesus who would become the dominant pastor at the church of Jerusalem, and he went away. He gets out of town as such to go to another place. Verse 18, now as soon as it was day, there was a no small stir among the soldiers. What was become of Peter? And when Herod had sought for them and found him not, he examined the keepers and commanded that they should be put to death. And he went down from Judea to Caesarea and there abode. And Herod was highly displeased with them attire and sign, but they came with one accord to him. And having made Blattis, the king's chamberlain, their friend, desired peace because their country was nourished by the king's country. And upon a set day, Herod, arrayed in royal apparel, sat upon his throne and made an oration unto them. And the people gave a shout, saying, It is the voice of God and not of man. 
and immediately the angel of the Lord smote him because he had not given God the glory, and he was eaten of worms, and he gave up the ghost. But the word of God grew and multiplied. There's powerful sovereignty displayed. There was powerful sovereignty displayed. This passage closes with God giving his church more evidence that he's in control over everything. We see God proves supreme over the opposition. We see in this portion of Scripture that there was a disagreement or an argument within the region of modern-day Lebanon, and the port cities of Tyre and Sidon uh, had been at odds with Herod about when he cut off their food stuffs, you know, then, well, sorry, been at odds with Herod, and Herod, because he didn't care about anybody but himself, cut off the food stuffs, and they're like, okay, we need to work out a deal. I am really, con- you know, condensing what took place. All right, and they got back together and worked things out. And during this time, Herod makes a, 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 a speech to a crowd assembled, and it was probably at like a, a Roman sporting event. Again, he wanted to play the, the, the uh, favor of the Romans. He wanted to be like a Roman. So it was probably at a sporting event. And Josephus records for us, that's an extra biblical source, a Jewish historian wrote, that his royal apparel had silver foil woven into which it caused the glitter when the sun shined on it. And when he got up to speak, it sounds like Herod had a great voice and he used it and uh, the glittering off of his garments. And it's the voice of a God and not of a man. And uh, Herod didn't stop that. He probably like, yeah, that's me. I'm in charge here. They described Herod as a deity. And this wasn't a case where Herod, uh, Herod, Herod didn't know different. He knew because, he, again, he knew, he nominal Jew, he knew this was wrong. This was blasphemy. And God smote him. Again, Josephus wrote that he lived about five days after being smote and his body was rotted and eaten by worms there's all kinds of thoughts about what they were. I'm not going into it. It was a horrible death. That's all that needs to be said. The king who dared persecuted the Lord's people dies a horrible death. He is struck down in front of all those people. He refused to glorify God, and God killed him in a gruesome way. It was a lesson designed to teach them that God is greater than all. God is greater than all. The same is true today. Our duty is to serve the Lord faithfully and leave the opposition to God. If we could ever adopt the mindset of David, it would help us a great deal. When he went and faced Goliath, he said, this is the Lord's battle. This is the battle for God. This is the battle is the Lord's. It always has been and it still is and always will be. You know, no enemy of the Lord will escape his judgment. From the bum who lives in a ditch and blasphemes God to the man who lives or the woman who lives in the highest place of authority within a country, within a society, and blasphemes God and brings down his name, they will be judged. There's no escape. Well, there is one, and that is to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Amen? That's the escape. But if they continue that way and die that way, they they won't escape the judgment. Verse 24, but the word of God grew and multiplied. God protected the church. They were concerned, and rightfully so. They seen their leaders being taken away, and they weather the storm. They seek shelter in prayer, and they saw the Lord... Save Peter, and then the Lord expands their reach, expands their outreach in ways that just a few days before they would never thought, a few days before they thought they were all dead, or they would be dead. They learned a lesson that they were not responsible for the success of the ministry. They were merely responsible of being found faithful in the ministry. And that's true with us today. Success is not measured by uh, you know, how many, how many people have we all, all the seats filled at Legacy Baptist Church? Is the coffers overflowing? No, there, if that was the, the definition or 
the metrics for being successful, you know, John the Baptist and the prophet Jeremiah would have been absolute failures. No, the success of a church and success as an individual believer rests with the Lord. And what we need to do is just to be faithful day in and day out, day in and day out, and day in and day out, and day in and day Do you understand? It's a marathon. It's a lifelong journey. It's not a sprint. Our duty is to be found faithful. And part of our faithfulness and being the Christian that we need to be is that we need to be in prayer. Bringing those things to the Lord. Let's be faithful. With every head bowed and every eye closed. Church, we need to be following the Lord as individuals, personally and then corporately following the Lord. Let's take this moment as piano begins to play. We need to examine our hearts and make sure that there's nothing between us and someone else because that would affect our prayer life. We need to make sure we're good with one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. We need to seek God corporately in prayer, praying for one another. We need to call on God by faith. Not in a casual, half-hearted way, but open your heart and bring those things to the Almighty God. We need to look beyond our own needs and lift up those who are around us in their need. In prayer. Let's be faithful in praying. Bring those things to the Almighty God. He cares. He knows your name. He knows your problems. He knows what you're facing. Bring it to Him. It's amazing how God answers prayer. Let's be part of the solution. Let's be bringing things to prayer to God. Prayer changes everything. Dear Jesus, help us. This portion of Scripture clearly shows us the power of prayer. And Lord, help us to follow the example of that early church who prayed for Peter. Lord, help us to be praying for one another. Help us to be praying for our lost world. Help us to be faithful in ministry for you. Help us to believe that prayer does change everything. Lord, I pray you be with us this week. Be with our kids. Be with our parents of our church as they send their kids off to school and help instruct them in righteousness. Encourage them. Help our church. Help us to be faithful in our witness. Help us be faithful in praying for one another. I pray these things in your holy and precious name. Amen. You're dismissed. Thank you. I appreciate it. I need them. <laughs> Good. How are you? Good. You guys heading anywhere today? Staying close to home? Homo. That's a good place to be. <laughs> Carol, good to see you. Keeping well? Good. Staying close to home? You're welcome. Good morning. How are we feeling? <laughs>